All aboard! For this stagecoach is about to move out! It is for everyone that has potential and would love to be a superstar. Yeah, buddy, this stagecoach is leaving for fun timesville. And the Lord God is your driver. To see that we have a safe trip. AC is your conductor. Right here, Friday night at 12.30. All aboard! All aboard! All aboard! All aboard. Hey, this is the special for John Singletary running for mayor. Lonnie Hamilton speaks. Lonnie knows everybody, so. Yes, well, I'm just coming from church, and I, um, I said, um, I want you to know that John is like a son to me, and he lives in my neighborhood. When he told me that he was interested in running for mayor, um, I said, I'm supporting you. Um, because I think that it is time that a person like John be given the opportunity because John is capable. I mean, very capable. I can think of nobody else in this community, his age, that I would say would walk in to City Hall tomorrow and take over and run, run the town. John knows, John knows everything about the budget. He knows any, everything about the operation. He knows ev because he's studied that. And many of us don't do that. Um, so I'm just happy to see you guys here because it, it's time that we take, that when I say we, we the people, the little people, um, get a chance to be involved in making a decision um, in this community. Uh, if you look at it now, we don't, have, we don't have any decision. We can't make any decision. We are told, you know, everything is fine for us, but in, we, don't, we don't get a chance to make any decision. And I'm so glad to see all of us here. You know, we um, haven't had a chance. You understand, all these years we haven't had a chance to, to say, let us for one day do something and be in charge of something. And I'm so glad that you are here so that you can give him some, some support. He deserves it. He's had a rough time with the city of North Charleston. And it's time that with his understanding of, of everything that went on there, it is time that he get a chance then to represent us. And he'll treat us much fairer than the others have. So I thank you so much for allowing me to say something tonight and for what you will do to help John. On election day now, tell all your friends because you know them. I'll say this and I'm through. I was talking to a black guy from Ohio at the convention um, and he moved to Salt Lake City. Now you don't see black folk that much in Salt Lake City. That's in the mountain. We don't care about the mountain, you know. <laughs> so we don't want to live there. Anyway, I was talking to him. He said, sir, say, I don't know you. He said, but um, I enjoy talking with you today. He said, you know us black folk, we like to, we, how you put it? We like to get, get ready to get ready. So every day you see us, we're getting ready to get ready. So I'm happy that you are not waiting to get ready on election day, that you're doing it now. Thank you very much. AC Funtime Superstar. Hi, this is AC. And now we take a break. The candidate for mayor, John Singletary, is running for mayor of North Charleston. We're going to take a break now. We're going to Waterville, Island, Margaret Gray Drive. Fun under the sun every Sunday afternoon at 6 p.m. Last Sunday was this powerful band that we are looking to have back Soon. to be Bill Wilson and the secret ingredients. Please do enjoy. The next voice that you hear will be John Secretary, Mayor for North Charleston. Right after Bill Wilson and the secret ingredients. Hey, yo, yo. We all kind of still in a bad way. After the going down in Charleston. Oh. But surprisingly it has um, kind of brought people together a little bit more. But you know it's time to put away oppression. Put away prejudice. We need to find love somewhere. Which it only comes from the man from the God. You know what I mean?
Madonna There's too many of you crying Brother, brother, brother But too many of you dying You know me We've got to find a way To bring some love here today Oh, Bob, Bob, yeah. we don't need it to escalate. What is not the answer? Only love can conquer. Hey, you know, gotta find a way to bring some love here today. Pick it up, hard bill. Pick it up, hard bill. The word is new, hard bill. The brutality. I wanna talk to you, and you'll see what's going on. What's going on? What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Ooh. For the mercury, oh, oh, oh. mercy, mercy, me. Get off, girl. Oh, things ain't what they were supposed to be. Oh no, baby, dying. People cry, yeah. No food to eat. Why? There's food everywhere. Why are people starving with no food? There's so much food they're throwing away in gallons. I mean, millions of tons of food a day. Yet you got people crying. You got people dying because they don't have no way to go. They don't have no food to eat. Right. Many people don't know, but Lonnie's our political consultant. I say Lonnie's our political consultant because 
anytime there's a question that comes up that deals with politics in North Charleston, I can go to Lonnie day or night and get an answer. That's late at night sometimes when I walk in, 11 o'clock, and I ring his doorbell, and gladly he comes to the door. Early in the morning, we have no time limits when it comes to accessing the knowledge that Lonnie has. And when we take a look at someone who's been in politics in the Charleston County area that is still respected, Lonnie has to come to mind. He has to come to mind because he's weathered the storm. And so he is the wind beneath the wings that we fly on for North Charleston. And I thought it's important that you know that. When it comes to North Charleston, we all know that the fair share that we're looking for, the level playing field for some whites and many blacks, we've not been given that opportunity. I say whites and blacks because many of our local whites are missing out. They're missing out because there is an undercurrent. There's an overriding present administration agenda to decrease the number of African Americans and increase the number of Caucasians, whites. Why? Because it allows the constituency base to change from 50% to 38% to where they really won't need the vote of the African American community. And much like what happened to downtown, they will be run out of North Charleston. We as a community, we need to bring together the unity that has always been here. It's not because blacks and whites don't love each other. Because we went through that with integration. When you have one parent who has three children and they give all the resources to one, it creates strife between the children. Not because the children don't love each other, but because the parent has misapplied the resources. And that's what's happened to North Charleston, that the resources have not been evenly distributed, and as a result, there's strife between the races. Not because they don't love each other, but because the misapplication by the current administration. As a group of whites and blacks, Hispanics together, we can change that. We can change that. We can bring to North Charleston a level playing field that gives opp opportunity to everyone. Everyone here. When we take a look at the budget, it's $105 million. $66 million goes towards the wages. We look at the chart on the wall, the first one on the left, top, 50% African-American, 12% Hispanic, 38% white. But when we come down and we look at the contracts, $40 million worth of contracts, $5 million going to 62% of the population. That means $2 million goes to blacks and Hispanics, $38 million in contracts goes to whites. Many who are transplants and people who do not even live in the city of North Charleston. When we look at the wages, we see on the top right here that there's an unequal distribution of the wages. When we read the diversity report, it says very clearly, nepotism is the overriding way that the city uses in terms of a method of assigning jobs. So if you are a family member or you're close within the mayor's circle, then you get a job. If not, you don't. We look at the chart underneath it. You see that there are three red lines. Those three red lines says that there is three departments where African Americans get more than their fair share of the jobs. Now when I say more than their fair share, that means that they are employed at greater than 50% in those departments. There are five departments where there are zero African Americans with 50% of the people in the city being African American. You'll see that there's absolutely no department where there are no whites. Now the three red 
We're talking about sanitation, recreation. For picking up trash, cleaning up the parks, but not at the administration level, at the hard working level. And then zoning, because zoning is used for their gentrification process. And they can use the fact that they will say it can't be discrimination because a black person is doing it which is what they call a non sequitur in the legal field, it does not make sense. Here today, we have an opportunity like never before. We've got the opportunity as citizens of North Charleston to come together with 100,000 citizens. 77,000 are eligible to vote. We've got, of the 77,000 eligible to vote, 53,000 already registered. 30,000 are African American, 23,000 roughly Caucasian. The mayor only receives roughly 6,000 votes a year. Last term, he got 6,119. 47,000 people roughly slept in. That's an embarrassment for the people that died trying to get us voting rights. When we consider what's going on now, in our community, roughly 4% voted. 1% difference with all those lives that were lost. So we have an obligation to get out and to convince other people, listen, you got to vote. That vote is like gold. You can't waste it, throw it away by laying in bed on November 3rd. A Christian can't expect a non-Christian to act with Christian values. Christian principles. Someone who doesn't understand the power of the vote. We as voters who are registered who want change, we can't expect them to understand that that vote has more power than a lump of gold. We have to explain it to them. We have to explain to them and educate them as to why you have to take that vote and use it on November 3rd because you can get yourself out of the ditch that you're in. Now, we can say what the administration that's there presently there is doing is wrong, and it is. But that does not negate our responsibility with that vote. What they're doing is wrong. What we're doing is equally wrong because we have the power to bring ourselves out of the ditch. Praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome to Do You Really Want It? Hey, call someone right now. Let them know, hallelujah, that do you really want it is on the air. I have a word from the Lord for you today. And I'm telling you, this is a powerful word. This word fought me for a while. But, you know, I just thank God that I kept with it because it, it, it is so much needed. So you call someone right now. Let them know, hey, this word is on the air. Well, this word is entitled, Harboring Unforgiveness. It's part two. Unforgiveness, man, is a sickness, I believe, that, uh, and a device that, that the devil would use to destroy the people of God. We harbor that unforgiveness. Harboring means that you're holding on to something that you just don't want to let go. And I'm telling you, as a witness myself, I have done this in the past, and I'm trying to train myself right now to never do that again, to love unconditionally, to love like God loved. The scriptures say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Look what God did for us. He gave up the ultimate gift, hallelujah, that we can have everlasting life. What a God. He never hold any grudge against us. And you know that we have done some things, hallelujah, that we, that we didn't deserve grace or mercy, but it was given to us freely from God. You know why? Because he loved us with the same measure of faith. And I just thank God today, hallelujah, that he had touched my heart, which later on you're going to hear my testimony, that caused me to turn things around so that I could be elevated instead of being pressed down. Now, Unforgiveness, like I said earlier, it continued to be a sickness, and it was in me for a long, a long time and a lot of years. I got to say that. And some of you that are saved, full of the Holy Ghost, you might say, man, you're not supposed to be carrying that around. But sometimes, you know, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and evaluate our own self and see where we're at and, and, and suffering with lack. And that's the way I was because I couldn't figure out how come I can't, you know, how come I can't grow? 
what's stopping me from, from, from having these things that I ask God for? You know, why is it that every time I feel like I got up and I'm, I'm, I'm running this race and all of a sudden I'm back down again? You know, and then finally the light came on. One day I found myself, you know, getting angry at a situation that was over years ago. Already been born again, already been saved, preaching and teaching the word of God. And, I'm, and then I questioned myself, why am I getting angry at this situation? I mean, this been over a long time ago. Could it be that I have not forgiven that person? And that's what it was. But then when I saw myself, I wanted correction. Now, this is what I had to do. I had to move myself out the way. And I noticed by moving myself out the way who I was. I was very selfish. I was very self-centered individual. Because I only thought about my feelings. Now, if I should pull a coin out, a quarter, what it might be, on it tells me it has two sides. So it's two sides to every story. And a lot of times we harbor unforgiveness and we're so angry at that person or that individual for hurting us. And you forgot there's another side there too. I mean, we all fall short of the glory of God. So I can't say that I am perfect, that I didn't make any mistake. I didn't say anything that, that uh, didn't hurt that other individual. Uh, other individual. Uh, it's a cruciate that we would say, stick your bones might break our bones, but words will never hurt us. Words can get you killed. And I remember by just looking back at the situation, some of the things that I have said and I have done. When God began to show me myself, then I began to humble myself. You know, he said, a humble would taste the grace. And I wanted to taste God's grace because I was sick and tired of just fighting a battle that I just couldn't win and wondering why I can't. Uh, be elevated, why I'm not being blessed, you know, why God is not using me in the areas that I felt that he should use me in, because my spirit just wasn't right, because I was harboring unforgiveness, okay, one thing I love about a word is that when God gives it to any minister, any preacher, is that, you know, it comes to you first, and they have to work you first. And once you see yourself in that word, because we all fall short of the glory of God, you can give it to someone else, and you have to speak it with compassion. So I'm trying my best today to give you this word that God, God has given to me. Now, sometimes God will, 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 will show you that, uh, you know, this is what he wants you to do because he will put people in your pathway. I heard a story about this this young man that was married to this lady, and she cheated on him, and it devastated him. Apparently, the guy that uh, she cheated with, he knew. So, in his spirit, man, I'm telling you, it was a battle that he was dealing with. Make a long story short, as, as I was told the story, is that his wife, long time died, but he's still holding a grudge against this man, and she's dead. How long are you going to murmur? How long are you going to hold on to something that's going to just come to kill, to steal, and destroy you? Because it, it, it is a device that Satan will use to bring you down. See, God came to give you life and give you life more abundantly to build you up. How long is it going to take you to see it's not your will, but it's thy will be done? Move yourself out of the way. And that's what I had to do for myself. I saw that I was selfish. Because I only saw things one way. And like I told you earlier, it's two sides of the coin. Now, forgiving someone can be difficult. Yes, it could be. Only because you put yourself in the way. You don't want to see. I'm going to bring forth a message to you one day. I can't see myself. You can't see yourself because you're too busy looking at yourself. It's all about me, myself, and I. Nobody else does matter. No matter what people tell you, what people show you, you still don't see yourself. Understand? Because you're too much into yourself. So I'm saying if you will humble yourself, pray and see God's face and turn from your wicked ways. See the things about you that are wicked. And if you're harboring an unforgiveness, and I'm telling you, I know this is a powerful word today because you got brothers and you got sisters and you got family members warring against each other because something they feel like they they have done to one another. You understand? But you hurt me in that way. You shouldn't have done that. You took this. You did that. I remember a story about five or six years ago, right here in North Charleston, where a brother killed another brother with an axe. What? What reason does he have to do that? To raise up against his own brother with an axe and murder him in such a a vicious way? 
unforgiveness, holding that evil in your evilness in your heart. I'm telling you, and that's what it is. I'm 60 years old right now. And Lord, if I can tell you some of the things that I have done and what I have said, I'm telling you that I have put in that dark closet that nobody else know about, you wouldn't like me at all. But guess what? Grace be to God. He hears me when I repent it. When I said, Lord, please forgive me. Before we go any further, I'd like to let you know how to contact Reverend White. The telephone number is 843-452-3314. You can email me at this address, do you really want life at yahoo.com. I would love for you to make friends on Facebook with James M. White for each week. I would like for you to see the conclusion of our message. I would like for you to stay tuned because we come to you every Friday night inside the AC Fun Time TV. That's Friday night at 12.30 and Saturday morning at 9.30. That's inside the AC Fun Time TV on Comcast C2. And right about here, right about here, we'd like to take a break. We're going to visit Bill Wilson out at Watermelon Island, Margaret Gray Drive. That's the address, Watermelon Island. Make it a date, don't you dare be late. Every Sunday afternoon at 6 o'clock. <laughs> Clean fun. And fun under the sun. The next voice you hear right after Bill Wilson will be running for mayor of North Charleston, John Singletary.
consider we are the largest city with African Americans in South Carolina, 50,000 strong. We don't even have, with a $6.5 billion retail sales, the highest in the state for the last 30 years, we've grown from number nine to number three in terms of population. 6.5 billion, we don't even have a black bank here. Every Monday morning, our organizations run and dump our money into another man's hands. And if we ask him for a loan, he usually says no. But when he does, there's a racial surtax attached to it. You pay more in interest, more in closing costs. But we don't have to continually allow ourselves to be treated like that. We have an opportunity this time to get out and every day until election time, convince someone else that, listen, don't go to sleep on November 3rd and allow your opportunity to bring jobs to your community and to your household to allow that to pass away. You know, oftentimes I hear my brother Larry say that Tip O'Neill said, politics is local. And it's true. The things that the president have done we will realize some of those benefits for years to come. He stacked the deck for us at the appellate court, never done before. Most of our court cases only get to the appellate court. Very few get to the Supreme Court. So he knew what he was doing when he stacked the appellate court, not the Supreme Court, because we don't get to the Supreme Court. Those things will be realized in time, but for immediate relief, the politics is local, so we have to Take that vote on November 3rd and go over and use it. We are cashing in the check that Martin Luther King talked about when he said we're going to Washington to get paid, to get the check cashed that they gave us that was NSF. We're talking about the vote. We can do that on November 3rd. We can cash that check by going in and voting for a new administration, one that's going to give fundamental fairness, level the playing field, for blacks, whites, and Hispanics, Indians, Chinese, Japanese, all the people that are in our community. We take a look at the weed and seed program. $1.2 million per year, 10 years. $13 million that was given for union hikes to change the crime rate. Because the study that was done nationally said that you have the seventh worst neighborhood in the nation and the worst street being Echo. And so through the Department of Justice, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a weed and seed grant to change that. The money was taken after they enlarged the territory to consider Jacora Cherokee and then Liberty Hill. It was taken and diverted over to Oak Terrace. John C. Calhoun's were torn down, and when they tore John C. Calhoun's down, they ended up taking those funds to build a neighborhood that is owned by the city of North Charleston. When you take a look at the resolution or contract between Sidrus that gets paid $9,000 a month, it clearly says that the city owns Oak Terrace. 99% Caucasian. 
There's no reason why a city with 50% African American should take the dollars given to the low socioeconomic community for crime prevention and divert it to a community that they own and that they control fully that it is a 99% white community. When we take a look at the South Carolina Department of Safety report, it says that between 2011 and 2015, they did a study. And I know oftentimes you'll feel that, well, we're being targeted in our community. That study said that there was 122,000 818 stops where people were not given tickets. No ticket. So that means that you were stopped unjustly without cause. Out of the 122,818 stops, a total of 80,250 belonged to African Americans. 65% of them. That means that the South Carolina public safety report proves that racial profiling goes on in North Charleston. And this is based on data that North Charleston gave them. No one else. The reports and the statistics that I talk about, these are things that North Charleston have reported. And now sit back, relax as we go for a break. We're going to take you back to fun under the sun with Bill Wilson as he talks about the fact that we need more love. Bill, take it and away. just continue to testify where you left off on the last break. We need more love. Everybody need love. All right. Ooh.
Jamie Ganaway Paisley. My husband and I, uh, James, we're given the mayor uh, a drop in at the house. You all are welcome to come. The address is 8102 Sardis Court. That's in North Charleston, and that is in Northwest Estates. It's going to be from 6:30 to 8:30. 8102 Sardis, S A R D I S Court. It is off of Green Ridge Road. It is actually the first house when you come into the community on your right. And what time is that? From 6:30 to 8:30. And again, I'm Stephanie Ganaway Paisley. The date is July 25th. It is the last Saturday in July. Still judge. Still, still the honorable. <laughs> um, again, my name is Virginia White Jameson. I'm a Charlestonian, born and bred, North Charleston High School, Bonds Wilson, no, Bonds Wilson High School in North Charleston. I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry, Mr. Helder. Um, this is really a new experience for me but I felt after confrontation with the city council, the hostility that I met with, that we need to change and we need to do it this year. We don't need to wait any longer. We've given everybody our best interest. Now we need to take it back. Um, again, I'm, I'm running because we don't have that communication in this city that we need. Um, like my mama would say, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. And this is the time for us to be involved. It starts with one vote, one person, and we need to do that. We need to tell everybody in our neighborhood, in our churches, and our communities, because this is our year. Um, everybody's saying this is our season. This is our season, y'all. We need to do it. Thank you. Floyd Daughter. See, see what you can do in your neighborhood. It's very difficult for John to reach out. He's one man. It's very difficult for him to reach out and go into all these neighborhoods. But if he has ambassadors, this is the community that needs to get John Singletary in office. Because John Singletary is not going to play favorites. I know him well enough. He's going to level the playing field. My name is Joyce Thrower, and my, um, my foundation, Achieve Foundation, along with um, DJ Chuck T. Yeah, oh, definitely. Can you, um, I'd like to leave some. We want to register people to vote. And what we're doing is several voter registration rallies throughout the city of North Charleston. Um, one of the problems we notice with the statistics here is that we have several people a lot of people registered to vote but they're not coming out to the polls but then a lot of them aren't registered at all so what we want to do is change that we're totally nonpartisan, and our first rally will be this sunday from two to five o'clock i just put it on the marquee at shallow sda church and we're just trying to get people to come out so Anyone that you know of who can come out and register to vote, that's how we're going to change things here in North Charleston. It won't be through protests or anything like that. So it will be through voter empowerment. And that's exactly what we want to do, empower the citizens of North Charleston by getting them registered and getting them out to the polls. So we want support of everyone. Like I said, this one that we're doing on Sunday is the very first of a series that we're going to do around the city of North Charleston. And employees from the election commissions down here on headquarters will be there to register individuals to vote. So um, just pass the word on. You can um, email us at achievefoundation at gmail.com and my phone number is 843-324-8484. My name is Tamara Derricotti Rios. Um, you, we're talking about 80% divorce rate with people with children of autism. So it's huge. Um, so I was just really happy to know that John was willing to work on this. And this is something that crosses all spectrums of color, um, economic um, situation, it doesn't matter. Autism affects all of us. So we're talking about as far as even training police force and how to handle that population. My son was almost tased in our own home. So it was no reason for that. Um, I could tell you lots of stories. 
um, but that's okay. I'm just very excited about working with John. I've spoken with him for years about trying to get on board. And when he said, Tam, I'm gonna do it, I said, you know I'm there. So anything that I can do. Greetings, everyone. Um, when, I, when John told me that he was running for mayor uh, and I called to Payne, and we immediately say we're, we're on board. And uh, two days, two to three days um, before the shooting, um, her last conversation, she was setting up a meeting for John to meet with Reverend, Reverend Pinckney, which is her pastor. So uh, we talk just about two, three times a day and sometimes um, you know, more than that. So let you know she was fully committed. And um, um, after the shooting, I introduced um, her kids to John and, and um, Grayson was her older daughter said, she has to finish where her mom started. So Mayor John. <laughs> But without the dollars, we cannot run the campaign the way that is being affected right now, effective. And so look within your budget. If you, we're not asking you to do anything that all of us working with the campaign is, as yourself haven't done. Look within your budget. Don't stretch yourself. If you can do something, God bless. If you can't, God still bless. But we ask if you can do a, a, a monthly donation to the campaign of what you're able to do. We're asking for 100 you can't do 100, we're asking for 50. If you can't do 50, 25. If you can't do 25, 10. Whatever you can do, look in your budget. On a month-by-month -month basis, we have four more months left. Four more months left. The last three months, I can guarantee you, the mayor's coming out. He's going to blast with signage, possibly radio advertising, TV. We can't outspend them. But we have to get signs out. We have to get information out in terms of flyers cards and that's going to take money and so whatever you can do within your budget look at it we're all we're all on the tightrope but i know if we get him elected it will be the most effective thing we can do for ourselves and our community so look within your budget like i said that's the last feel i make it all the time please whatever you can do look in your budget and do it as god god uh, puts it on your heart all right Let me and back out at Fun Under the Sun. Stop by and let us know. And this is North Charleston's documentation. The diversity report. In here you also see the weed and seed program where the funds are being diverted and given to organizations not in the target area. You'll see where the city says that the reason why African Americans do not have jobs is because they don't want to work. When the study says, no, 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 the reason why they don't have jobs is because of the nepotism in your hiring practices, that they actually apply more than anybody else to get the jobs, mm -hmm. and that the right thing to do is to use parity in the assignment of the jobs, the contracts, the resources, and you have failed and refused to do that. So, in here, a dog kennel they used cost $3.8 million. A dog kennel. When you say that I can't afford a body cam, because the whole police department, it would require $275,000. And you can t spend $3.8 million on a dog kennel, or $2.5 million for walking trails. 4.5 for a soccer field, or I can give Westcott, that's not even in the city, $1.5 million every year to offset the cost of golfing. But yet, I can't put any money into infrastructure and in what's considered old North Charleston. It should be an embarrassment. So for those white, black, green, purple, polka dot who want the right thing done, they have to stand with the numbers. And the numbers say that the African-American community is not being treated fairly and that we have to 
in the sake of security, we have to make sure all of our citizens are given fair opportunity. Over on West Surrey, I spoke with an older couple, white couple, sitting on the porch with them. And we were talking about the neighborhood. They said that, well, uh, there's drugs in the neighborhood. I'm afraid to stay in it. And so after explaining to them that the reason why your neighborhood may be like this is because the disproportionate assignment of jobs, contracts, resources in the community, let me explain to you what I mean. So the gentleman who had grown, been there forever, even he remembers the block wall that went down between West Surrey or East Surrey and Forceman Street that separated the white people section from the black people section. And I said, when you have 50% of the population receiving 15% of the jobs and are denied the right to have a job that they could earn a living for their family, it jacks the crime rate. When we look at the latest book, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, and she says it's the joblessness in a community that escalates the crime rate. It doesn't correlate that it is the responsibility of the escalation, but it correlates with high crime. And it doesn't matter what color the person is, white, black, Hispanic, when there's chronic joblessness in a neighborhood, the crime rate is going to go up. And so that's one of the reasons why here you see that in your neighborhood there's a high crime rate. There are few jobs. Out of the $40 million in contracts, $2 million going to one sector, $38 million going to the other, to the 38%. So that's why you see the crime in your neighborhood. Had fairness been done, your neighborhood would still be protected. Because these boys who are walking around being harvested like crops out of a field would be on the job. Mm -hmm. See, they harvest our boys like crops out of a field because it's profitable. Okay, let me explain to you exactly what I mean. The federal government pays from fifty to sixty thousand dollars per year for a prisoner. Okay? So if they can take our young boys and harvest them out of the street, put them in jail, which incidentally on Leeds Avenue, 73% of the people there are African Americans. So when they put them there, someone gets the contract for the food, the clothing, and everything that they need. Mm -hmm. What that means is that the boys are more profitable for someone in jail than on the street working. And so if you take four boys and each spends three months, you got a year out of every four. And so the money still trickles in even though the boy gets out, spends nine months out, three months in. The contract carries on. And so when I finish, I'll answer some questions. But, but that's what goes on is that we have to understand that's what's going on is jobs, contracts. We look at Ephesians, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 7 and 12, and it says very clearly, your protection in your community is wrapped up in your knowledge and your money. It also tells you that the knowledge to know that better than both of those, God for salvation, is the very best. But it still leaves the two nuggets on the table. That one, we have to have knowledge. We have to understand what's going on. The comprehensive plan, the transparency report, the report that gives the budget. All those things we have to look at because we have to put them together to see the big picture. It, picture it's like a puzzle. We get the little pieces and we put them together. Now we finally see what is going on. The money, funding streams, they cut off. The number one funding stream is jobs. $66 million worth of salaries. We get $10 million, they get $56 million. Jobs have been cut off, that funding stream. $40 million in contracts, $2 million versus $38 million, cut off. Lawsuits. If you've got a lawsuit, 
and you're an African American in South Carolina, it will probably end in a pretrial adjudication. Summary judgment, before it gets to a jury, before it gets to a judge, it's going to end because that's a funding stream. And so think if you had a $2 million lawsuit, how many people in your family, your church, your children, grandchildren would benefit from that? When you cut off the funding streams, there's no money, there's little knowledge, there's no protection. 12,000 students in North Charleston. 4,000 at one time were in failing schools. We don't have one city high school, not one, that is passing. The three here that are passing are county schools, military magnet, academic magnet, school of the arts. So when our children come from the elementary level to the middle level and go to a high school, and there are none here that are passing when the county schools very few of our students go to, then what happens? Not only can they not get into college, but it breeds an underclass so manufacturers coming in will have something to cherry pick from. And that is what's okay. happening. Now I can go on and on. There's a million things I love to talk to you because I stay up hours at night. Lonnie's come by and I'm sure he sees my window open uh, on four or five in the morning. But it's because I'm trying to understand with crystal clarity what is going on to our community. And I need to tell you that I'm not doing this because of any type of vendetta. I'm not doing this because I feel that I have to be the person to go in there and straighten it out. When we took a look at, and other people, my brother Larry, Ramon Rowe, when we, I talk to Lonnie all the time, and I know he thinks it's, uh, uh, he's just talking to be talking, but every nugget he gives me, I take it and I use it. And so when we look at the big picture, we said, look at what's going on in our community. Something has to be done. And so we decided we're going to get somebody to run for mayor because the polity is strong mayor, weak council. And when that is the situation, you have to have someone in the mayor's position to change things. And so we decided we would find someone to run. And uh, finally, uh, I was chosen to be the person. So even though my name's on the ballot, it is all of us that's running. And I believe that when you're chosen to run versus choosing to run, there's a big difference. Because the people are behind you. And as long as the people behind are behind you, then you're not in it for yourself or by yourself. And so that's where we are. We are a group moving forward. This is a pattern and practice investigation that they're going to do against North Charleston. And so if anybody's interested, then you can start a sheet, sign it, and then we'll send it up to them. They came down and we spent some time with them. Uh, we told them what that we were trying to do, what has happened in the past. Uh, and because of the Walter Scott situation and many other situations, that's not the only one. I'll pass this around and you'll see six or seven similar situations like the Walter Scott that they're looking at, and so a pattern and practice investigation will probably ensue. I just got this from them, and as a result, uh, I'm going to pass it around for you all to look at. Mm -hmm.